Christy and Joanne. And our PSW, personal support worker, Cyrus. If you have any access questions or issues, please find you and me, she slash her, or our or access coordinator. <laughs> Who is wearing a bright orange shirt and standing at the folding table next to the canopy at the front. At that table, you will also find Siebert, he slash him, who is also in a bright orange shirt. If you want a spot on the accessible bus, we have a mini bus with spots for wheelchair users and spots for ambulatory users. Siebert is making a list and will notify, notify you when it's time to board. The table will also have water, granola bars, masks, earplugs, flyers, large print versions of the flyers, which we will hand out in the crowd. Second, a note about masking. We are handing out masks and asking people to wear them if you can. We trust you are aware that many of us live with precarious health and can be prone to catch whatever is around us. Last year, we heard from a lot of you who couldn't wear masks for many disability related reasons. This year, it has additionally become clear to our organizers that while many in our disabled community continue to mask, many do not. As a march that is almost exclusively attended by Crips, we decided to remove, not to, decided not to remove crips who don't mask outdoors, especially on public streets where many do not mask. Our movement is built on codependence and cross disability solidarity principles. We ask that you wear a mask if you can, because you give a shit about our lives. We have struggled with how to honestly bring DJ principles of wholeness, leadership of those most impacted, and solidarity to this march if we inadvertently marginalize those who are additionally marginalized. If you don't know that some of our most marginalized members of every single one of our communities have stopped masking, you are simply not living in proximity to us. Deluding ourselves or the community does not deal with the inner community issue that some of us, have, including our immunocompromised, have chosen to stop masking. How can we work together on this without shaming each other to have greater clarity as to why people are choosing not to mask? This includes communities that we have been trying for the past two years to build relationships, real relationships and solidarity with behind the scenes. The idea that we would invite these communities amongst us and then ask them to leave because they won't mask are police crips who have experienced repeated long-term long care home lockdowns or pretend that it's a medical exception is unimaginable, does not lead to the collective liberation we are looking for. For those who ask why we can't make a mandate and not enforce it, if you're not enforcing it, it's not a mandate. We got support from many of you in our actual community. As Crips, we are constantly being denied basic bodily autonomy and others limiting our actions based on what they think is best for us. Dignity of assessing risk for ourselves is part of our autonomy. Last year, we did not mandate, and almost every single person in our tiny march wore a mask. We admit this was an experiment. We promise to listen and reassess every single year. But let's not eat each other alive. While the Ableheads contro actually control the disregard of our lives, skip off into the sunset. But we want to make it clear. We ask you to please, please mask up. The expectation is that you mask here out of solidarity, even if you do not anywhere else. We want to thank Mask Black Toronto for helping us with providing and handing out masks. If you are missing a mask, there are also masks at the access table at the front. Wearing a mask, if you can, shows solidarity with the disabled community and by protecting the immunocompromised people who cannot wear a mask. By protecting the immunocompromised property people you will come to connect with people the next, in, the, in the next few weeks. The ever privatizing fragile healthcare system and the entire greater community. Next, for the second year in its history, today's TDPM is an abolitionist march. We have chosen. We have chosen not to have police escorting or marshalling for us, though, as you can tell. We don't get to choose <laughs> their uh, presence. But we know that as Crips and as poor people, we believe it is safer without them. We have many experienced marshals and volunteers who will help ensure safety, along with Toronto street medics and legal observers. 
As we move into our second year as an abolitionist march, we also want to make clear what abolition means to us. We mean abolish the police and the prison industrial complex, yes. We also echo the call previously made by many grassroots activists to abolish the long-term care home industry and develop instead systems of just care together, a call most recently made by DJNO, Disability Justice Network of Ontario. I don't have to tell a bunch of crips that congregate jail-like housing and social workers are our greatest cops. But for those who don't know us, our housing is not just regular housing at an affordable rent, but institutions with built-in surveillance and policing right where people live. So as TDPM, we want to be clear that our abolition, we also include so-called social affordable housing, shelter, and social work industries. Last year, I spoke of the place I lived at St. Clair's Multi-Faith Housing, a congregate housing for mostly Indigenous and disabled people that staff so-called activist social workers. They started permanently locking their stairwells and making it so you could only fob to your own floor. ODs in the building unsurprisingly skyrocketed. This policy is still in place to this day. This locked stairwell policy is not even used in care homes and is a logical expansion of what we have all collectively allowed to happen to houseless folks at shelters in the city, which is a logical expansion of what we have allowed to happen to incarcerated folks. Behaviors that are typical of mad and disabled folks are pathologized and criminalized, along with the colonial reality that as of April 2022, Indigenous women account for 50% of all federally incarcerated women. It is for these reasons that TDPM connects the struggle against the prison industrial complex to our struggle in care homes, to those of us in jail-like affordable housing, to those of us in shelters and or houseless. Next, a change we made this year is the route. The traditional route we used to go down Bay Street to TMU, and we had chosen it last year to honor our previous organizers. However, we had a couple issues last year with ending at TMU, which included turning off the power when we got to the quad, which was a sa real safety issue for all of us, particularly for electric, uh, sorry, <laughs> electric mobility gear users this year, we decided to change the route and end it at Grange Park. This was done for a few reasons. We want to be visible as, as visible as possible. We want to ma march past sick kids to let disabled kids know they are worthy and are loved. We wanted to end at a... We wanted to end at a park where we could celebrate as a community that had accessibility features such as accessible benches, water fountains, bathrooms, including an adult change table. Additionally, our fundraiser is finally live. As people on ODSP, we struggled to figure out how to hold money while not being able to open a bank account for TDPM without being a nonprofit, something we do not want to do and having ODSP restrictions on how much money we could personally hold. After many meetings with other grassroots orgs and small banks, and thank you to those grassroots orgs, uh, we have finally figured it out, opened a TDPM bank account, and are accepting e-transfers at torontodisabilitypride at gmail.com. If you can, please donate to help us keep marching and keep improving the access. This is an example of what collective work can look like. Because of these issues, we've had to get creative these past couple years. We want to thank SILT, Center for Independent Living Toronto, Disability Without Poverty, DWP, Disability Justice Network of Ontario, DJNO, Showing Up for Racial Justice, Surge, Toronto Neighborhood Centers, TNC. Thank you all for your financial support and for making the last couple years happen. Uh, as organizers who have pushed TDPM into more radical territory, we appreciate the support more than we can say. I am so honored to introduce our first speaker, Janet Rodriguez, our OG disabled organizers in the city. If you've been involved in organizing in the city, you've probably met Janet at some point. For so much love, we introduce an original TDPM organizer who taught us so much more than we can articulate. Please, please give a warm welcome to Janet.
Can everybody hear me? Okay. So, thank you and welcome everybody to the 13th annual Toronto Disability Pride March. And I want a big round of applause to the new uh, generation of organizers. So, I, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the elephant in the provincial room, the AODA. That legislation was enacted. Welcome, Peter. <laughs> So 19 years ago, in June 2005, the then liberal, uh, liberal government enacted the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. Everybody knows it as the AODA, AODA, and similar names. Many advocates at that point were working to have a dedicated piece of legislation for us, for disabled people. And they were hoping that this new legislation, the AODA, would be an improvement from the previous legislation, ODA, which was the Ontarians with Disabilities Act. That was enacted four years earlier by the Mike Harris government. Do you remember Mike Harris? Boo, yes. Okay. So that legislation had absolutely no teeth. The AODA was supposed to be an improvement. And I emphasize the word supposed because while it was an improvement on paper, really there was no money and, and resources put to make it a reality. So this was the first piece of legislation that focused specifically on people with disabilities. But of course, we already had the Ontario Human Rights Code since 1962, and the item of physical disabilities was added 15 years later. We're usually kind of like the tagged at the end of the rights list. And also, let's not forget Section 15 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms that was signed in April 1982, which, and I'm quoting here, guarantees rights and freedoms to all Canadians, including those with mental or physical disability. Right? So every individual is equal before and under the law, and has the right to equal protection and equal benefit under the law without discrimination and in particular without discrimination based on race, national or ethnic origin, color, religion, sex, age, or mental or physical disability. That sounds great, doesn't it? Sounds fantastic. That's in the Charter of Rights. So if I were a bit more cynic, I'd be going through life thinking, well, I am well protected. I am protected against discriminations based on the fact that I am a racialized person. I am Peruvian, so national origin. I am brown. I'm cisgender woman. I'm over 50. Let's not go there. I live with mental and physical disabilities. I feel six times protected. I'm super protected against discrimination. So, like many of you, why is it that I actually don't feel protected? I don't feel that I can actually cash in my rights in making this brief history of how is it that we're getting to January 1st, 2025, which is only 180 days away, where the province is supposed to be fully accessible, and it is not. Transportation is not accessible, employment is not accessible, education is not accessible, healthcare is not accessible. Shame. These words are usually a reaction of the government when they feel the pressure we put. So they kind of yield and they say, what can we do? What can we do? Let's make a law. 
let's do this. Let's put beautiful paper, uh, words on a page, but it's all very inert. These acts and declaration are just a small detours forced by a community of lived experienced people. Many of us have been indoctrinated and educated in the colonial system of oppression. And although I was born and grew up and was educated in a place far away from here, I too was educated in a Eurocentric system that rewards achievement. They even give you a diploma, nice piece of paper, so you can tell others the stuff that you know you know. So when we feel the oppression and we protest and become a thorn on the side of the government, they know how to fix their discomfort. Let's create legislation. Acts like the AODA and most recently the Canada Disability Benefit, federal legislation, uh, they, it, it's only, um, these legislations demand compliance. They tell the organizations, you have to comply with this regulations and they fail to effectively hold people accountable so these rights written in the papers can actually be realized they make this legislation for compliance but compliance does not ensure accessibility For the longest time, I was hopeful that this clear mandate of the AODA will translate into concrete changes. It, it only mandates to identify, eliminate, and prevent barriers. That's the AODA in a nutshell. And it's so simple, right? But who is keeping the organizations accountable? Who is making sure there are taxpayers' dollars are not used to continue to build things that are inaccessible, like the Metrolink, the new subway cars, uh, buildings, and all you know spaces, uh, even colleges and universities, they continue to put those beautiful sets of stairs up front and make it inaccessible for people. Yeah, woo! That's why 11 years ago, we decided to take the streets and for the first time we marched and rolled in our wheelchairs and walked with our canes and our walkers and we declare ourselves proud to be disabled. We don't need fixing. We built a community that survived the forced isolation of the COVID, COVID pandemic and in fact it helps us expand the reach because everything was done through virtual mediums and many people from different places all over Canada were able to attend our virtual marches. And it is through disability justice principles of leadership of the most impacted, intersectionality, cross movement solidarity, interdependence and cross disability organizing that we can make change. As I mentioned before, we're less than 100 days away from the AODA deadline of January 1st for compliance, but we are as excluded from accessible and deeply affordable housing as we were before. Shame indeed. We continue to live in legislated poverty and isolation but when we gather, we build an inclusive and codependent community. When we add our limited resources and our few spoons, beautiful things happen. Look around. This is the 13th annual March, and we are here to celebrate. Let's keep the fight. Let's turn our frustrations into fuel for our movement. Let's lift each other up and across 
all of the different movements, whatever you find your strength to volunteer, the decades of mercury poisoning of the English Wabigun River has caused disease and disability for the First Nation uh, people of the Grassy Narrows. So we're asking you and inviting you to connect and come to the Day of Action on September 18. Let's all march for justice. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much, Janet. Next, we have Ohona Mendy, she slash they. Ohona is a community organizer and an undergraduate student at McMaster University. Ahona is passionate about disability justice, anti-oppression, abolition, and dismantling the school to present nexus. Uh, hi everyone. Um, yeah, just a little bit more context um, about me. Um, yeah, I work currently at the Disability Justice Network of Ontario. Um, where I am the education coordinator. So I work with um, racialized black and indigenous disabled youth who have experienced um, unjust punishment at the hands of the education system in Ontario. So yeah. So like was already said, I'm an undergraduate student um, and a community organizer. Um, and so while the Disability Justice Network of Ontario operates um, across all of Ontario. Our hub is in so-called Hamilton, Ontario. So those are the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron, um, Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee and Mississaugas. Um, and so for context, Hamilton was also deemed the hate crime capital of Canada in 2019. Um, and we also have the highest um, density of disabled people um, across all of Ontario. Um, but today, I am also happy to be here and honored to be here with all of you in community and in solidarity. Um, and I'm endlessly grateful to the work of the organizers who make this show of disability pride and justice possible year after year, so thank you. Um, but I also want to be honest about the fact that I'm showing up here tired and in grief. Um, feelings that I would say disabled folks are deprived of space to feel, especially publicly. Um, but I think it's important that with the pride that we hold here today, we also carve out some space for our collective anger and our collective grief. Um, yeah. I'm thinking about um, Landon Ferris, who is a 16 year old, who was a 16 year old high school student with Dravet syndrome who was um, found unresponsive last month after a seizure that occurred in his school, which ultimately resulted in his death. I come here angry um, that regardless of countless warnings about the dangers of carceral and punitive and ableist conditions in schools from disabled students and from disabled caregivers as well, um, that leaders in education have so recklessly enabled this loss of life so I come here with the understanding that we can't have disability pride without centering the reality that oppressive structures across this country take disabled life time and time again. Um, and I can't stand up here without holding Landon, his family, and all the other disabled students and their families whose lives have been this devalued and lost to the state at the center of everything that we do. I also come to the space as a second generation um, Bangladeshi, so as the daughter and the granddaughter of survivors of the 1971 US-backed Bengali genocide, um, in which Canada was also complicit, which took three million lives um, and disabled countless more in a genocidal project of ethnic cleansing, of extraction, and of dispossession. And so I can't separate this part of my identity from the ways in which I choose to show up to these spaces, just as I know we can't separate our fight for disability justice um, from our collective local and global struggle against imperialist forces. 
So I also show up here knowing the importance of explicitly naming the fact that the very ideas at the core of colonial projects across so-called Israel also lie at the heart of colonial projects across Turtle Island. Um, and so I oftentimes center, you know, all of the work I do um, very much around education. And so thinking back to one of the first places I was able to recognize just how deeply interconnected these systems of oppression are. Um, I think back to 2020 when I was a high school student um, and served as a student trustee at my local school board. And I was told by a trustee who was elected to represent students that Arabs and Palestinians were hopeless and that they were terrorists. Um, and around... So, yeah. And around the same time, it was this very board of trustees um, and at this very table that I witnessed trustees consistently and without fail choose to prioritize surveillance and carceral measures against disabled students who are consistent targets of both violence and negligence. Um, and so in recent months, as I've continued to work with disabled youth and families who have been unjust, unjustly suspended and expelled from their schools, I've also witnessed a rise in punitive measures against Palestinian, Arab, and Muslim students given recent surges in anti-Palestinian racism. And I want to be clear about the, the fact that these two issues cannot be understood as mutually exclusive nor separated from the reality that our education system and the systems across this country continue to deem racialized, sick and disabled bodies as defective and therefore deserving of punishment and further debilitation. So when black, indigenous and racialized disabled folks continue to urge the disability movement to engage in solidarity with the Palestinian plight and other anti-imperialist efforts to cut financial ties with Zionist organizations, to stand in solidarity with organizers and student protesters who have also been physically brutalized, criminalized and censured by state forces. We're also imploring our communities to understand that it is our collective responsibility to denounce genocidal forces. Because just as we know that police brutality that results in disablement is no coincidence, we know that all state violence is intentional and it is interconnected. And this is something that has also become very evident as we've come to learn that Gaza now has the highest number of child amputees across the globe. So that is to say, when we say disability pride, we also mean indigenous sovereignty and self-determination. We mean land reclamation, we mean anti-capitalism, and we mean free Palestine, Congo, Sudan, and all other occupied peoples and lands. We say disability pride knowing that we keep us safe, and we mean nothing about us without us, and not one body or one mind left behind. To me, showing up for Gaza means showing up for disabled folks here um, and that, you know, we know that this is not separate but deeply interconnected because disability justice cannot exist without cross-movement solidarity, without building community and people power amongst the poor, the oppressed and the disabled in our own communities and without centering the interconnectedness of, of our struggles and our interdependence. Disability justice cannot exist void of an anti-colonial, anti-imperialist, anti-carceral, and anti-apartheid politic, and it can't blossom without each and every one of us centering these struggles and the struggle of global indigenous, the struggles of global indigenous communities. And I also want to center the fact that it cannot survive without consistently challenging and denouncing the military industrial complex, prisons, and carceral colonial systems every single day, whether that be policing, prisons, long-term care homes, or otherwise. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for sharing space today and for doing the hard and meaningful work of actually just being here and existing in community, choosing to collectively exist and resist and imagine freedom, to imagine self-determination, um, and liberation from all, for all from Turtle Island to Palestine um, and across the globe. So thank you. Now we have a speaker that's actually part of our organizing committee, Peter Steele. Hamilton, Ontario. I'm the Hamilton connection to uh, TDPM and for all its Pride, I'm a wheelchair user, and uh, I'm here to talk about Go Transit and Metrolinx today. Their uh, their ongoing struggle to have their their electric their their spots on, on their Go trains and buses 
where you, where you plug your, your wheelchair in or your scooter in to have, make sure they have them turned on because a, a lot of the time they have the outlets turned off and it's not good. When you, when I travel between Hamilton, Toronto, after a day in Toronto, my anybody in a wheelchair or a power scooter, your batteries are going to run down, okay? No matter what, okay? Yeah. So I need to get a charge to go home on the go train or the go bus, and that, and half the time I'm down on one bar of power on, on my display on my wheelchair, and I have to stop off at another station in order to plug in in order to get a charge to go home, you know? So. Metrolinx is not listening. I've traveled from between Hamilton, Toronto, from West Harbor Go Station, Hamilton, to Union, and a lot of the times their outlets on their trains are not turned on, okay? And the point is for wheelchair users and scooter users to have those outlets turned on their buses and their trains in the wheelchair spots so we can get a charge on our wheelchair so we have power to get home. Once I get back to Hamilton, I'll have power to get home. That's the point of my speech. But Metrolinx has not given a listen. Uh, one of our other members of Toronto Disability Pride has started a petition online against Metrolinx and Go Transit and that. What was her name? Started it. Uh, you'll have to, it's Maddie's the one that started it and that. Okay. My other thing to talk about is I use a uh, communications program because I cannot read. It's a program, it's called Let Me Talk, it's on an Android tablet. It has pictures and symbols and on there, and under each picture is the word of how it's spelled, like if I hit. My name is Peter Steele, I live in Hamilton, Ontario, and I am a member of Toronto Disability, Disability Pride. So I push a, push a button and it talks, because I can't read, so, and it's spelled underneath the word. This communications program, Let Me Talk, is free or you can pay a couple dollars for it, okay? It will run on iPad or it will run on, on Android. You can either get it from the Apple Store or from 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 Google Play Store and that. And it's important to have, see, what happens if I couldn't talk? There's a lot of people out there that can't talk that have to use a communications device in order to communicate, you know? And most of them, most of them are powered by their wheelchairs. They're plugged into the batteries of the wheelchair. That's how mine is set up and that. So there's quite a few programs out there. You have to try them out to see which one will work with your device. Some of them work, so some of them don't and that. So I guess that's my speech for now. That's, uh, my name is Peter Steele. I'm the uh, Hamilton Connection to Toronto Disability Pride. Like film called Tell Them You Love Me. It felt very, very important to have someone this year talk about assistive communication devices. Next, we have Abuzar from QT Case. So, um, Ariel will talk about it a little bit later, but TDPM, along with grassroots organizations, are planning to hold uh, consistent town halls and other events and actions and demos uh, throughout the year. Uh, having a, a march, uh, having this event only once a year is not enough, especially if we're going to push back against what's happening around CDB and like so many other things right now. So consistent organizing is very important right now. Uh, Within conversations within various different grassroots groups, there have been a lot of problems and issues that have been coming up. Uh, so I want to expand a little bit about why we need town halls, and Ariel will go into it as well a little bit later. Uh, a lot of our community organizing, the way we work and think, is shaped through colonization. It's time to take a critical look and confront the colonial legacy that continues to fracture our movements and hinder our collective liberation. So, we've often seen uh, coalitions uh, form around vital issues like police at pride, these are just examples, uh, abolitionist politics um, or pinkwashing. Uh, not only are single issue groups or politics ineffective, uh, but they also represent a colonial mindset. 
While each of these struggles is undeniably important, a colonial framework that prioritizes competition for political capital, ultimately, uh, it keeps us divided. Woo! This process, it, it pits us against each other, preventing us from building the unity we need to dismantle all forms of oppression. The coalition model that is now becoming common is capitalist and colonial in nature. We need to start shifting towards community-based organizing where all of us work together to tackle all of our issues as a unified whole, uh, leaving no one behind. <laughs> to truly understand the interconnected nature of our struggles, we must look back at the devastating process of colonization. Colonizers brought their queer phobia and transphobia, transphobia to these lands violently suppressing two-skirted people. Similarly, there was no homelessness on indigenous land. It was introduced by colonizers as a tool to force people into competition and exploitative labor. Shame. Colonizers designed a society that systemically disables people, uh, perpetuating ableism through every facet of their social structures. The nonprofit industrial complex was developed from the colonizers' charities which were designed to perpetuate colonial violence and uphold systemic inequities under the guise of benevolence. <laughs> Social work is an extension of the policing system, monitoring and controlling those it purports to help. Social housing, rather than providing a safe haven, is another arm of the prison industrial complex, perpetuating surveillance and displacement. The residential schools that traumatized generations of indigenous people have morphed into the CAS, continuing the cycle of harm. We cannot address any of these issues without addressing all of them. These are all fundamentally anti-colonial struggles. Yeah. Even our ways of organizing have been colonized. We see it in the exclusion of lower class and homeless people from leadership roles. We see it in groups competing for resources and recognition instead of resolving conflicts and forging a, un a unified front. It's time for a radical shift. <laughs> That's why we're calling for a series of community town halls rooted in anti-colonial practices. We need to bring together a broad cross-section of our communities, including disabled folks, queer and trans folks, indigenous and black folks, people of color, poor and working class people, and everyone impacted by colonial oppression. This is not about presenting the most popular and radical optics. It's about being the most effective by rejecting the capitalist modes of organizing that have been infiltrating our movements. It's important to understand that anti-colonial practices center uh, on building unity, community-wide consensus, and processing conflicts. By working together, we can build a resistance movement that, that dismantles colonial power structures and works towards collective liberation. So we're hoping to organize one or two town halls leading up to Trans Day of Remembrance. We're calling it Trans Day of uh, Resistance. Uh, that will be on November 20th. And uh, it will be co-organized with TDPM and a number of other grassroots organizations. Um, and also, there's talk about having a Reclaim the Streets event, uh, possibly in September. Uh, can I just have a show of hands on how many people here would participate in or help organize town halls? Woo! Maybe? Okay. Um, how about a Reclaim the Streets event? Would people be interested Woo! in participating or, yeah, or helping organize? If so, please find Ariel or me or like some of the other organizers and yeah, please get involved. So there is a couple speakers that were expected here that could not make it. Some emergencies came up. So we just want to say that we're not going to have uh, Gaitre be able to speak today. And we don't see Sarah Jama here, so we're going to assume the same. Um, so that will conclude our speakers for the day. Uh, we are now going to start loading the bus. So anybody who wants to get onto the bus, please uh, start making your way there. Um, start heading there. Before we head out, thank you again to the ASL interpreters, Christy and Joanne, and to our PSW, Cyrus. 
we would like to thank every single person that helps make TDPM possible. We make no secret that we are still learning every day. We can never do this without the support, advice, or help of our elders, communities, and other grassroots organizations and activists. We want to give a special thank you this year to our TDPM organizers, who are finally all at the same place at the same time. Can we get TDPM organizers up here? Is that possible to get all the TDPM organizers up here? We're on trip time, so it might take us a couple minutes to all get up here. <laughs> the group um, and just what we've been able to do together. So just a giant thank you to the other team organizers. All right, well, we will again have a feedback form after the march. It's on your flyers as well, the QR code, but your feedback last year was priceless. So please uh, give us more. <laughs> it will be on our social media and website after the march as well. Um, as Abby mentioned, we are coming up to the AODA Accessible for Ontarians with Disabilities Act deadline. We are watching the Canadian disability benefit be raised. We are losing more and more people to MAID every day. There is massive work to be done to have people recognize us as fully human, full stop. We want to organize to community town halls throughout the upcoming years to talk about what we want as a community and how we could start organizing together towards those goals. One of them for me would be housing. Woo! Woo! Pretty exclusively crip for crip. Um, but there are people today in the crowd that I've met at different rallies, at U of T encampment, at marshals from different movements. People who might otherwise have no connection to disability justice are here today. I thank you for coming here. I hope we will start seeing the interlocking nature of our oppressions as the key to our liberation, not a distraction from it. We cannot be free if Palestine, Congo, Sudan, and Haiti are not free. We cannot be free when we are still normalizing the continued slow drip genocide of indigenous peoples here. We cannot be free if trans children are not allowed to grow up. If black lives matter only when it's the social justice flavor of the month. What happens to each of us has a butterfly effect that will affect every single one of us. Freedom for Crips has to mean collective liberation. And freedom for those of you joining us from other movements has to start including freedom for Crips in a real way. In what is essential queer Crip wisdom and what never stopped being true at TDPM, pride is a protest. We scream together, we rage together, we mourn together, and then we live our best lives and celebrate that we are still alive and still together. We will have some musical performances from the Raging Grannies and Andrea Atala once we arrive at Grange Park, along with the food and celebration part of Disability Pride. We will make our way to the driveway behind us, now after I'm done speaking, um, with the cue to start moving and marching, being the giant disability pride flag. They will be at the front once the pride flag starts moving and you hear a drum beat. That's when we start. All right, everyone, let's have some noise and have a good march. Woo!